Hello, everyone. Welcome back to this episode of Just Another Year Chicago. My name is Nick Rohde. I am joined alongside two very special guests, my good friend Will Wright and Adam Rank from ESPN. We are excited to have him on. We're going to talk Bears football. We're going to talk fantasy. We got it all for you guys. Before we begin, please hit the like button on this video. Put your thoughts in the comment section below. We'll be commenting back at you. And if you like this material, you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. But Adam, thank you for joining the show. Excited to have you on. Oh, thank you so much for being here. At some point, I'm, I'm waiting for Will to center his camera. Look at us. Look what? at Nick and me. <laughs> Nick no. and me are perfect, perfectly perfect. aligned. Now you yeah. got it. Is that better? I would, I would not have been able to concentrate the whole show. Being like, that why is, is that why, why am I seeing so much of this of his blinds there? I'm sorry. How you rude of me to come in and I'm like the set director. Already. I love it. I'm, I'm already making you start to show. We were sitting there before. The, I'll, I'll pull back the curtain. I don't care because it's the way I go, Nick. I don't I don't care. I love um, it. We were talking about stuff and we we're shooting the breeze. And I'm like, this is the stuff that should be on the show because we're talking about our optimism for the Chicago Bears. And I always I don't understand. I guess I do. But there's always a feeling like whatever team it is, whatever sport, there's always those people who always have to be like, well, I don't want to get my hopes up. I want to do. I'm like being a fan is irrational. It really is like our, we should not let professional sports affect our mood, our happiness or anything like that. Take this much of our income, but we do. And this is something that we decided to do. Why not just try to have the best possible time and be optimistic. If you're going to be this foolish to invest so much of your time into this foolish endeavor, be optimistic. Who cares? Like I, I went on the NFL network and said that we we're going to win 13 games, 12 games, whatever it was. People are like, you're crazy. You're an insane. Like why? Like it happens every year. Like every season, there was one team like who who would have seen this come? Like somebody did. Somebody called it. Some optimistic fan saw it. Like who who would have seen the Jacksonville Jaguars do? Like a bunch of people in Duval County saw that and called it last year. So just don't worry about it. Don't worry about looking foolish. Don't worry about like oh people are gonna think I'm crazy. I'm in part. Who cares? It doesn't matter. Just go out there and no, enjoy Adam your life and be optimistic. So two things for you. This show is based off the caption, optimistic sports for optimistic sports fans. F got you right there. I'm, we're Boom. all on the same page. We I'm are in. crazy. Will and I are were the only people for a long time saying double digit wins. Everyone called us crazy. Suddenly the tides are turning in three. Chicago Bears Twitter is honestly the most toxic on Twitter sometimes. Everyone's like, <laughs> I just want to shut this thing off. But I'm happy to hear that you're on the train. Will is absolutely on the train. And I am full blown. I thought the Bears were going to win 14 games last year, and everyone yeah. called me crazy. Clearly, I was crazy, but that record was flipped well, on half right. Well, <laughs> I mean, like you think about it, they lost what eight one score games that would have yes. given us 11 yes. wins. And it was something that Ryan Poles addressed on Tuesday that we got to start closing those games. And I think that even the most optimistic fans like ourselves can sit here and, and believe that Justin Fields is going to go out and throw for 4,000 yards and is going to be the quarterback we thought he was going to be coming out of Ohio State, but at the same time, still hold them accountable of like, I believe in you. You also need to do it. Right. And if you don't yep. do it, then we're going to start having some conversations about finding somebody who can get it done. But I, I'm of the belief that Justin will be able to, to make it happen. He still has to go out and do it. And I think you can be that kind of fan. You can be optimistic. But you could also be like, well, you know, there's some things uh, there were some opportunities lost last year. And that's where I think that DJ Moore helps out an awful lot. He's not going to be out there, you know, like last year when they were trying to rally in those games, you know, Justin's throwing to Equinemius St. Brown, who at times I was like, are you playing football or are you playing volleyball? You look like you look like Sinjin Smith out there setting the ball up for Randy Stoklos to come in and spike it. Like what is happening? He's Misty May all of a sudden. Catch the football. Uh, if we had a couple of guys who could have made some plays last year, that record could have been reversed. And I will even say this, and I know this happened before the, the New England game, so it really doesn't correlate, but I feel like losing that Washington game kind of set a bad precedent in those close games. It did. They, they it did. won the New England game because they blew them out. I mean, right. they essentially blew out the Patriots. But if you would have established a winning mindset in that game against the Commanders, I think that in the game against the Cowboys and the Dolphins and the Vikings and all these things, I think those could have gone the other way. And I think they will go the other way. They just really need to figure out a way to get some wins, have some success, and then it's going to snowball like it did last year. We saw the Lions rally at the end of the season. We saw the Minnesota Vikings win a bunch of one-score games. I think that's very attainable for the Chicago Bears. 
And Adam, you know, Will, I want to go to the 4,000 yard comment in a second, because I know that's a very hot button for you and you love to talk about it. One thing that I want to say is that the dagger in the heart for the Chicago Bears last year, in my personal opinion, was the Giants game. Because the Giants game also was so close. There were so many butterfinger moments by a few people that we're not going to name on the show. But it was just so frustrating because it w- the Giants ended up being a decent team. And they yeah. still can be a decent team. And the Bears were right there the entire time. And it both teams just played very poor early season. But I got to agree with you. That Washington Commanders game when Mooney was inches away from winning the game or at least tying it. I agree with you putting the dagger in the heart right there. But, but also but but also that was the the Bayless Jones Jr. game and I would I would consider myself a friend of Bayless Jones and I talked to him I mean even after that game I'm like hey you know what like I I can I can still acknowledge that a mistake was made but be yeah. like hey listen like don't let this don't let this define your career and I think I even sent him a message or a text and I was like don't let this define you you know what like things happen like Jerry Rice once fumbled a ball in the middle of the field untouched in a playoff game against the New York Giants. Like, don't let these things define you. Build from it and go forward. And so he made some big plays, and so I'm optimistic that he's going to be able to improve this season. But you can still have those kind of, like, tough conversations. It's kind of like having children. Like, listen, I I believe in my children, but sometimes they make mistakes, and I got to tell them, like, no, you got to do better next time. And I think that there were obviously a lot of instances of that last season. And that's what Vellis Jones Jr. did. Uh, I will agree with you there. I mean, he bulked up this offseason. He looked great. You know, some of the workouts that he posted on Twitter. And, you know, Will, going into your what we want to talk about real quick with Adam in regards to the 4,000-yard passer is he's going to be a factor this year. A lot of people have him potentially on that roster bubble because of the fact that we went out and got Tyler Scott, DJ Moore, Chase Claypool's coming back. You know, you re-sign Pettis, you re-sign St. Brown. Not sure exactly what Poles is doing there, but it Mm -hmm. is a very busy wide receiver room. But Vels Jones Jr. could be a huge factor. You know, Justin Fields said to Ryan Poles last year, hey, this is the guy that I want you to go out and draft. And that's who Ryan Poles went out and got. The relationships there, they just got to build it. So I agree with you. You can't let that kind of moment define your career. And Will, you know, we kind of talked about it last time too with Bellas Jones. I think that he's going to be a big impact. But Will, why don't you kind of hit on a little bit? You know, we can kind of kick off the conversation of where Justin Fields' development is going to be this upcoming season and kind of what you're thinking. Let's see what Adam thinks from it. Well, honestly, I think that with all the new pieces around him, and Adam hit the nail on the head earlier, like, the reason why he did suffer so bad last year, let's be honest, the line was atrocious. The, the wires, Equinomia, St. Brown, Dante Pettis, I'm going to say it, even though you won't say it, that those guys, they dropped a lot of key passes at a lot of pivotal moments in the game. So when you got a quarterback of Justin's prestige and he's used to having Alove and, and um, the kid, what's his name? Jameson Williams, yeah. Yeah, they, yeah. when you used to having those type of wide receivers, they get separations, big plays. Uh, crunch time against Miami, he hit, I'm talking about, we learned this in Pee Wee. He hit yeah. Economic St. Brown with a dime. He dropped it. So I don't care who you are. At the end of the day, mentally, that will impact your will to want to be uh, successful and grow. Even though I think he's growing and developing great, despite what the national pundits are saying. That, that's why I say, Adam, at the end of the day, <laughs> right now, you're the only one, because I don't really even watch ESPN no more. I don't watch FS1. Because I know they have agendas that they have to talk about. But when you really look at Justin and the pieces around him, now you got DJ Moore, a clear cut number one. That's going to make Darnell Mooney and Claypool more lethal because now they're going against the second and third cornerbacks of each team. So neither one of them have an excuse on why they can't thrive. I do think that. When, when Justin goes back three step, five step, seven step, he's going to let it rip because he will have confidence that all of those wide receivers will be where they're supposed to be. Not like Green Bay where he throw a, a button hook to Equinomia St. Brown and he's so slow to come out of it and Jair Alexander steps in front of him for an interception. So that plays mental head games with any quarterback who's anticipating and want his wide receiver to be in a certain spot. We saw it early on in minicamp with him and um, DJ Moore – like it was like bam, like, like it, the 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 precision, everything was in tune. And then now you add a Bob Tunyon. I think that yeah. him and Cole Komet are really going to dominate the middle. I just want that this. The only thing I'm looking for because intermediate deep ball with Justin to me, I don't see an issue. 
But yeah. now I want him to start manipulating, hitting the backs in the backfield, Rashawn Johnson, Dante Foreman, even Khalil Herbert. So he will absorb less hits because out of those 55 sacks, I watched every game. Realistically, with his athleticism, he probably could have avoided about 20, 20, but he was trying to make a play because he was the best athlete on the field. Now he doesn't have to worry about that anymore. And that's why I feel 4,000 yards, let's do the math, 17 games? That's a yeah. little over, what, 230 yards a game? 235. Like, yeah. 235-ish. Right. So, that's some good so math. Right. <laughs> so at the end of the day, 4,000 yards, everybody said, well, if he gets 3,000, that's his ceiling. No, to me, that's the floor. Oh, that's not the ceiling. No. So, so, and then you look at the schedule. I'm, I, I look at it because I'm very analytical. I'm looking at the schedule. Like me and Nick mentioned, a lot of teams are going through either hard rebuilds or soft rebuilds. Uh, other than Patrick Mahomes and, and Herbert, we're not pay, playing a lot of top tier quarterbacks. Like mm-hmm. Justin will go in favorite in a lot of these games. So when you said 12 wins, I said, I said what, um, Nick? I said 11 wins floor, 15 wins could be possibly the ceiling. Like, yeah. What like why not? What is what is the game? What the one game where you're like, okay, like Kansas City is a better team than the Bears. Course, I think that right. I think we can be realistic right. and say that. But <laughs> with all these other like I don't know why you would concede. I'm not conceding that the Vikings are better. No, I'm, no. I'm not I'm not giving the, the Lions the deference no. and respect. Like everybody's acting like they won the Super Bowl. And the Lions had a fantastic end of the season, but they did not win the Super Bowl. Okay. They went nine and eight or whatever, whatever. Yeah. I hate this. I hate the 17 games, but I want to bring out something. Cause I do have some, some, uh, some notes here, uh, that I wanted to read to you. And I think that one of the big, I know it's like when Homer Simpson puts on the glasses, this is when, you know, I'm going to say something smart. Now, Justin Fields, or for a potential third season breakdown or breakout, excuse me. When you compare it to what Josh Allen and Jalen hurts did now, obviously the Buffalo bills went out there, got Stefan Diggs. Josh Allen has a huge breakout last year. Jalen hurts. They go out, get AJ Brown, huge breakout. Now in the first two seasons, Allen had a completion percentage of 56.7%, which is lower than Justin Fields. Mm -hmm. He was averaging 188.5 passing yards per game, which is higher than what Justin Fields had last year, but he was averaging 6.6 yards per attempt, which is lower than what Justin Fields did in his first two years. Jalen hurts. Completed 59.1% of his passes in his first two seasons. That's less than Justin Fields. He averaged more yards per game, but less yards per attempt. Like that is the one thing about Justin Fields is that the numbers are very similar to Josh Allen and Jalen Hurts, two quarterbacks that as, as recently as a couple of years ago, they said that Josh Allen could not throw a football. They said last year they did not feel that Jalen Hurts could throw a football, even to the point that the Philadelphia Eagles themselves were not convinced that Jalen Hurts was their quarterback of the future, so much so that they went out there and they brought in Gardner Minshew just as an insurance policy because they still were not certain. Justin Fields I is better than both of these guys coming out of college. He is going to be better than them in the NFL. I don't think it's an issue. And when you talked about the offensive line last year, We didn't even see Tevin Jenkins until August. We didn't know who was going to play center. We, uh, Lucas Patrick was injured. This is the first time that we're going into a season. And for as long as I can remember, where all five offensive line positions are set, right? We're set. We know what we're doing. We know who's playing where we know who's expected to do what everybody's got a role. It's very well defined. I think this team is set up for a lot of success. And they're young. That's the other thing, too, is that a lot of people don't realize how young this team is because out of the guys that are on the roster right now, according to ChicagoBears.com, there is six guys above the age of 30. Six. And Cairo Santos and uh, Patrick Scales are two of them on special teams. So take that as you will. Those guys can play forever, especially, you know, Manley played till what? He was, what, 42, 43 years old. You know, you have Cody Whitehair, who's just above 30 at 31 years old. And then you have a couple other veterans, Lucas Patrick, who just turned 30 years old. You have a lot of young talent. Eddie Jackson still is in his 20s. This team is so young, so talented, a ton of cap, and they're going to build together. And uh, Adam, we actually had the opportunity yesterday to talk to Josh Blackwell, who played for the Eagles before coming to Chicago last season. And one thing that he said that really stuck out to us in the show yesterday was that he Justin Fields is exactly like Jalen Hurts, quiet, humble, but hungry. And he's going to come out this year absolutely swinging in year three. 
And that's what's got a lot of people hyped up, including myself. So, you know, when you started going on that track, I could not agree with you more. And I had to just, you know, jump in right there because this team is young and that's what makes it super exciting. So, you know, on top of talking about that, you know, Justin Fields and Jalen Hurts, you know, year three for Fields, we've been hitting on it for a while. But Adam, from your perspective, what are you seeing out of it? You know, we added a ton of weapons. You know, we're, we added, you know, the offense is going to expand greatly. Luke Getze is going to give Fields a lot more because of, the, you know, he's worked on technique. He's worked on a few other things. He has the backfield, a much more dynamic backfield than last year. Like we were saying earlier, offensive line is back. What are you seeing, not taking it from Will, passing it over to you, what are you seeing from Fields this upcoming season from a stat perspective, from an overall type play, and a comparison to other players? Well, I think last season, what was so amazing was a lot of his pop plays, a lot of his YouTube highlights and everything like that were busted plays that he turned into long runs that were either touchdowns or should have been touchdowns. I'm thinking of the Eagles game or anything like that. A lot of times now, and I think a lot of that was born out of necessity because there was nobody to throw the football to. Like, who was, who was the go-to guy? And that's where DJ Moore makes such a huge difference. Coming in, playing the X position, we know where he's supposed to be on the field. We know that he can make plays, and he can make plays in a wide variety of ways. So in any, any instance where Justin Fields is in trouble, he knows he's got a guy that he can rely on, and he can go to, and he's going to come through. I think about the end of the Commanders game last season, Darnell Mooney wasn't able to make that catch. DJ Moore makes that catch. And so what I do truly believe, and this is going to be bad for the fantasy enthusiast, is that we'll see less of those huge runs. The scr- I mean, he'll still scramble. He'll still get some yardage running the football. He's not running for 1,000 yards, though, no. and we better hope that he doesn't. Right. We don't want him to run for, a, for 100. But I do believe that we're going to see more exciting plays with the deep ball. And I think that's where it's kind of not underrated, but it kind of goes under the radar for people outside of Chicago because they don't know what to expect with Tyler Scott and what he's going to be able to do. He played with a guy who is, I don't want to say similar, but Desmond Ritter, you know, was a mobile quarterback at Cincinnati. Tyler Scott had his best season with the Bearcats with Desmond Ritter, and now he's going to a better version. I think he's going to surprise some people. I think that Darnell Mooney is going to be able to live his best life. I think if Chase Claypool could go back to being the guy that we saw during his rookie season, getting eight, nine touchdowns, that's good enough. Like, you don't listen. I don't care if you get a thousand yards. If you approach double digit touchdowns, you're doing your job. And I think from a fantasy perspective, which a lot of people always want to hit me up about, understandably, like, I don't, I don't, I don't care. I don't care who the number one running back is. I don't care who the number one like statistical risk. Well, it'll probably be DJ Moore because he's going to get the majority of the targets. But like, right. yeah, when, when Bob Tunyon scores a touchdown, I'm not going to be upset. When Cole Komet steals one or some rando tight end that's not even on the roster right now scores a t- like, okay, that's just the way it's going to go. Uh, Kyrie Blazin game scores a touch. I'm fine. They're going to find a wide variety of uh, of ways to score. And I think that they've kind of diversified themselves and kind of spread it out. And it's going to be uh, it's going to be dynamic to see the way it goes. But like Will said, like if there is one critique, I think it's the intermediate timing throws. We would love to see him improve on that. I'm ready for it. Uh, we'll see what happens. But I think last year with Luke Getze, you know, he was also learning on the job. And it was such a roller coaster with Luke Getze, because at, at one point it was like, well, this guy, like we're we're losing him. He's going to be a head coach next year. And then it's like, can he be our head coach? Then he should have been fired. Then he was a great he- offensive coordinator again. Then he should be, you know, like he just went through a wide range of things. But I think that, you know, what he did last year was trying to establish what Justin's good at, what he's not good at, learning how to play call himself. So again, as quarterbacks improve, young players improve, young coordinators also get an opportunity to, Im- to improve. So I think we're going to see a lot of that as well. I'm excited. I'm excited about Luke Getze, especially you, you know, I think that it was an emotional roller coaster, not only for him, but for Bears fans last year. And now that he has the offense, you know, you bring in Chase Claypool halfway through the season. Will and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Is you bring him in halfway through the season, he's not going to get acclimated to the offense very quickly. Yeah. It was impressive what he was able to do in that short time, but then he got hurt, you know, as unfortunate as it is. But you know, it's an exciting season and he has, you know, players that are familiar with this type of play. St. Brown was a wide receiver when he was uh offensive coordinator up in right. Green Bay working with Rodgers. 
you know, Bob Tunyon, another guy that's coming in. And overall, and then Lucas Patrick from an offensive line perspective, you have every single area covered in order to, you know, kind of help guys like, hey, this is actually how it's ran, you know, from experience. This is what I saw in Green Bay. This is what we can do here. So I'm with you there. I think Luke Getze is in for a big season. You know, this is his opportunity. Poles went out and got everything that Justin Fields needed, but also what he needed in order to design plays to unlock Fields as much as possible. And going back to your comment, I hope I don't see a thousand yard rushing out of Justin Fields again. I hope yeah. I hope to see a total of over 4,000 total yards out of Fields. But back to Will's point, 4,000 of those being passing and whatever left over being running on design plays that help work out for him because he's going to have a lot better blocking offensive line. And that's what's super exciting about that. But, you know, Adam, Will and I wanted to ask you one question in regards mm -hmm. to not just the Bears. You kind of hit on like you don't care how the Bears do as a whole in fantasy as long as they're winning games, as long as the, you know, things are happening, the offense is scoring. But from a fantasy owner perspective, who in the NFC North and a player on the field, who should the Bears be most scared of besides Justin Jefferson, a player that's on the Lions, on the Vikings, or on the Packers? Who should we be looking most out for as the biggest weapon in the NFC North that could do something against Chicago? I really like the way Amon Ross St. Brown developed last year, and it was kind of impressive to see him. Like We've got the wrong St. Brown brother, unfortunately, it feels like sometimes. But I thought that that wasn't a fluke. I know people are trying to be dismissive of it. And as much as I don't have a lot of respect, not that I don't have respect for Jared Goff, but I don't think that Jared Goff is an elite level quarterback. But I think that what made him so good was having Amon Ross St. Brown, his route running, his ability to make contested catches. I think that guy's a true player. Like I, I think he's really good. Now, I don't mind saying that because the Lions had Calvin, had Calvin Johnson and did nothing with him. So I think that it's very fair to say, like, yeah, they're not going to – they're Amon Ray and St. Brown's not going to win anything for the Lions because they they had Matt Stafford, who is a Super Bowl M, or Super Bowl winning quarterback, and Calvin Johnson, who's a Hall of Famer, and weren't able, weren't able to win. So I think that that's – you know what? That's what the Lions are there for. Like, you have great players that are good in fantasy. Sometimes you'll win nine games, but most of the time you're just going to be a punching bag. And God bless them for it. That's what we that's what we need out of the Lions. That's your role. It's like watching wrestling. Like there's some guys who are just mid-card jobbers. And sometimes you get to you get the job to John Cena in the main event. But unfortunately, uh you're just a mid-card guy and uh that's what we do, but I like him. I like Jordan Addison as well. I really think that he can play and I really do believe that the Vikings are going to be their defense sucks. Like I'm sorry. Like I don't think that they're I'm not saying that they're necessarily not going to win a lot of games because they're certainly talented. You know, there's something to be said about winning those one score games. You expect a little bit of regression, but you're like, oh, they did find a way to win. Like you got to give them a little bit of credit, but that defense sucks, which means that Justin Jefferson's going to eat, but also Jordan Addison's going to be given an opportunity to also flourish. And we've seen that a lot in fantasy, especially if you're playing PPR or anything like that, where it kind of levels out the field. Jordan Addison could also be good, but I think that that's a step below. I think Justin Jefferson, the best receiver in the division, followed by DJ Moore. And then we have Amon Ross St. Brown. I'll take DJ Moore over Amon Ross St. Brown. But I think he's also very, but he's very good. Did Nick freeze? He Let's keep like, going. Oh, sorry, oh. I'm back. I'm back. I'm, say, I'm back. We look like the fantasy. That was weird. Right now. He was stunned. Sorry, he was, was stunned. Stun. I'm he was so stunned. Stun. Matrix, baby. He Nick, like, he was in the Matrix. He's like, Ray saying I, I nice things about the Vikings. I got to stop. I was like, I hang on. I got to take a minute. I got to take the red pill. I got to enter the other, the safe place again. No, I'm back. Sorry about that. That was very weird. But yes, I was stunned. But keep going, Adam. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, it's all good. But those are the guys. No, those are those guys. I think that they're, uh, I think those are the guys to watch out for. I'm interested to see how Jameer Gibbs works out for the Lions. I was intrigued by their draft because they drafted what? Jameer Gibbs. And, and then they drafted the off ball linebacker. And I'm yeah, like, Jack Campbell. Like, what? Like, what are you doing? I, I, you know I wish funny? the Bears got him. Just putting that out there. I really like Jack Campbell. But we went out and got TJ Edwards, and we have Sanborn and Edmonds. Yeah, I like Jack Campbell. I think he's going to be a good player. I do, too. I just, yeah. I, I think that sometimes we get so, uh, and this is another thing that fans do, is, like, worried about value. Like, where, like, it doesn't matter. If a guy plays, he plays. Like, it doesn't matter if you get him in the first round or the sixth round. I mean, it's nice when you get a guy in the fifth round like we did with Braxton Jones. It's a nice little feather in the cap, but at the same Noah time, Sewell. like Noah Sewell, you know what? Like, 
I think the Bears are okay. I, I just thought it was an interesting strategy. The night of the draft, I didn't think much of it. Or I wasn't in favor of it. But as we got further away, I'm like, okay. I was actually shocked. And this is one thing, too. Whenever people talk about Jalen Carter and the Bears, of course, they got they got drugged because they always do. You're like Whatever the Bears do, it's not the right decision, according to people in the national media or just fans in general. But I thought that when Jalen Carter was sitting there, there were two teams that had luxury picks. And I'm talking about the Seahawks and the Lions, who these weren't their draft picks. The Seahawks were, were using the Broncos pick. The, uh, the, uh, the Lions had the Rams pick. So if there was any team or any teams that could have afforded themselves the opportunity to take a flyer on Jalen Carter with two coaches who would be able to handle a player like this, like Pete Carroll, like this is nothing new for Pete Carroll. Right. He can, he can deal with this distraction. Dan Campbell. I truly, I, I honestly believe that he's built a nice culture with the Detroit lions where he would have been able to handle. I but I remember when he was at the uh, NFL owners meetings, Dan Campbell gave an answer about Jalen Carter where he was like, he was kind of like, not, I don't want to say dismissive, but he was, he, he made, he indicated that like the, the, the accident wasn't the thing that concerned him the most. But he's like, we have a lot of questions about why it appeared he took plays off or where his effort was down in and down out. And it was very interesting. And I'm like, well, Dan Campbell either thinks that this player is lazy and doesn't perform to his ability or that it's not a big deal. And going into the draft, I'm like, if the Seahawks and the Lions have both decided they don't want Jalen Carter, I don't want Jalen Carter either. Like, then yeah. I'm out. I'm out. Like you two aren't taking them. Like, yeah, we're out. Yeah. Why, why would we take the risk? We're not in that spot. And they think the Philadelphia Eagles, given where they are, uh, the ability to take a risk and absorb uh, a player. And they had multiple first round picks as well. They could absorb like maybe Carter not working out and it's a long ways to go. We don't know what's going to happen, but I think they had to be able to take the risk. And I think that the bears did the right decision, uh, made the right decision. So I don't even know why I started on that, but I just felt I needed to throw it in there. I didn't want him either. Will, Will, Will and I, oh. we talked about it. We did not want him because Poles has built such a good culture. Same with Flo Coach Flues. Poles and Flues have built this culture of, you know, well-minded guys, you know, good head on their shoulder, want to play football for the Chicago Bears, no distractions. I feel like Jalen Carter would have been a distraction. And like you were saying, Adam, we didn't have the luxury of just being able to take a risk. And yeah. that's what the Bears definitely – we needed that right tackle. And I think Darnell Wright was the guy. I was a big fan of him. I am still yeah. a huge fan of him. I think he looks great. I think he's going to be do great things for the Bears. He's been quietly impressing. I would rather him not be talked about at all during camp than be talked about for not playing well. And yeah. that's what he's been doing so far. So super pumped about that. So I agree with you. I think that the Bears definitely missed a bullet because there's already, I guess, been more troubles in Philly with Jalen Carter so far, and everything is starting to kind of creep up on him about his past. So I won't. I won't. I'm not. I'm not going to take any victory laps because I remember a couple of seasons ago when everybody was convinced that uh, Jamar Chase couldn't catch a football anymore, and you're like, ah, oh. <laughs> it's that time of year where everybody's overreacting to everything and. Uh, I think like Drew Locke was supposed to be the starting quarterback for the for the for the Broncos last year. Right. Wait, Seahawks, excuse me, Seahawks. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of crazy things going on, but I think the process was sound for the Bears, and I think that Darnell Wright and we heard today, or we heard, excuse me, on Tuesday, that Ryan Poles was taught about Darnell Wright, saying like, listen, we worked him out. He came in with his breakup revenge body. Like that's the one thing that. Ryan Poles absolutely wants is athletic offensive lineman. And it's one of the reasons why Braxton Jones, like they never wavered on him being the left tackle going back to last season. You know, people just expected like, well, Braxton Jones is working out at left tackle so that they could see what he got. But when the, when the games start, we Riley Reef's going to be there, whomever it was. And like, no, it Braxton Jones started the whole season. And even though, um, he didn't always make the plays and there were some deficiencies in his pass blocking. That you could cool. tell, Oof. but you could, but you could tell how athletic he was. Yeah. And I, I, I right. think that w there's not a lot of pulling tackles in the end. We hear pulling guards. We, we rarely hear about the pulling tackle and he gives them that kind of flexibility. And you see teams like the Chiefs and the Eagles using that kind of scheme and using that kind of offensive lineman 
which is why he's going to be highly effective. And I think too, when you play at Southern Utah, which is a division, it's a division one school. They played in the WAC or the all American conference. I forget which one, not a great one. I think it's the WAC, but in any event, like, Steve Smith had talked about this to me as well, where he's like, you know what? Like he played at Utah back when Utah was in the, was in the mountain West conference. And he's like, the first time you go up against an sec person, like it's different. And it's really up to you to, to, to accept the challenge, which is something that Steve Smith obviously did during his hall of fame worthy career. And I think that Braxton Jones is going to use last season as the barometer of like, okay, this is where I need to be. And I just, just consider him a good player. And I'm like, okay, you're going to be fine. Riddick, he's going to work out. He's going to do what he's got to do, and he's going to go out. And I think Darnell Wright's going to be in a very similar situation, although he played in the SEC, so I think he's probably further along. But I think we can expect him to be a reliable member of the offensive line. And, you know, going off that, two you words. know, you went up. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Will. Nick, hey, Adam, two words for um, Braxton Jones. Anchor and bull rush. He, if he get that settled – like you said, he already has the flexibility. He, he has the athleticism. The Patriots game showed that on that screen pass to Herbert, how he got out of space and took out that corner. But, man, that game against the Commanders, when Sweat pushed him back into a field, yeah, but Bill still got that pass off the pad somehow. Like, I knew then that, yeah, if he got to get in the weight room and go work with Olin Fruits. 100%. 100%. Like, and- and I agree with both. I agree with both you guys. I think the one thing that Braxton Jones doesn't get enough credit for is yes, he did get pushed back on, you know, during the commander's game. That was a tough defensive line to go against, but he also went against Bosa and did a great job as a rookie first game on literally a puddle of soldier field before what it was. He went up against a ton of other defensive talent last season and he held his own as the season went on. He had, I think he had six sacks in the first eight games and they only had two sacks in the last, you know, nine games of the season. Yeah. So clearly the improvement was there. And, you know, I agree with Will. I think the weight room definitely could be a beneficiary beneficial thing for him to go to. Uh, and he looks good so far. I mean, the pictures of him walking into house hall, he looked big, lean and mean and same with Darnell, Wright. Both of them just look like absolute anchors for the Chicago bears over the next couple of seasons. So, you know, hopefully this offensive line stays together. And also Adam, it's nice that we have a guy that went to the pro bowl as a center in Cody Whitehair back in 2018. Yeah. It's Probably nice his best position. Back. And yeah. exactly. And that's, and that's what Flusa is doing. And I, and Chris Morgan are doing, they're putting the p- players at the right position and they have a set squad. I mean, I cannot even remember the last time going back to the beginning of the show. I can even remember the last time the Chicago bears had a set offensive line walking into camp on top of it, a fully healthy offensive line. So yeah. that's just a huge plus that I think that, you know, anyone around the NFL, especially bears fans need to appreciate a little bit more. And I'm super, super stoked about it. But, you know, Adam, I know we only have you for a few more minutes here. Just wanted to get into our last subject. And thank you so much again for coming on. We loved having you and we can't wait to do it again. But, you know, we kind of talked about a ton on this show, but we really haven't hit on the defense at all of the Chicago mm-hmm. Bears. You know, uh, yesterday we, when we were talking to Josh Blackwell, he was talking about how excited he is, and especially how good this defense is going to be next year. You know, you bring in TJ Edwards, who had 130 plus tackles over the last two seasons. Tremaine Edmonds, 100 plus tackle kind of guy, and an absolute one of the arguably one of the best coverage linebackers in the NFL. Uh, you know, the secondary was improved going through the draft and through some free agency pickups, and the defensive line it was only up from last season, and they definitely made some big improvements. What are you seeing from a defense perspective of the Chicago Bears? And, and, you know, where do you kind of see them ranking and how do you see them performing over the next season? Yeah, you know, Ryan Pohl said this on Tuesday as well about taking that next step for a lot of players. And you think about Don Don Robinson, who looked so great in week one against the 49ers and really didn't do much noteworthy uh, for the rest of the season, but he's still learning how to play. He's still learning how to get acclimated, obviously has the physical tools to get it done. If he can take a step forward, he doesn't need to be an all pro, but he needs to be a consistent, reliable, rotational type players. And I think that the two players, the two defensive tackles that they took there in the second and third round are going to be guys that are going to be counted on. Again, like you just need to have waves of players. We've noticed that in Indianapolis, you know, obviously Shaq Leonard, tremendous talent. They trade for DeForest Buckner. But for the most part, like these were a lot of anonymous guys who were just coming through and were able to come in in waves. And that's where all the good teams seem to be able to uh, to really get it done. Like it's nice to have superstars and recognizable names 
that you call out. But as long as you can get pressure on the quarterback, especially from the three technique and then the from the trenches, that's one of the things like as much as we would love to see Yannick and Gokwe or somebody like that come in. If the Bears can collapse pockets and looking at some of the quarterbacks in the NFC North, when you look at Jared Goff and you look at Kirk Cousins, if you can collapse that pocket and get up on them, like it's very easy to, to fluster those guys and to force them into mistakes. And when you have tremendous linebackers like we do, we have an improving secondary. And that's the one thing, too. That I, 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 I will tell you this right now. Tyreek Stevenson is a player that I'm very excited about seeing. And I, I thought that last year, uh, putting putting Gordon in the, in the nickel slot, and I know a lot of NFL fans feel like the nickel slot corner is like a throwaway position, but that might actually be the most important, the most crucial. Like, think of some of the best receivers in the NFL. They line up in the slot. Mm -hmm. So when you have a great nickel corner, and the Bears play a lot of base defense too, where you're not really matching these guys up. When you have Kyler Gordon as the nickel guy to where like, look, we're going to, you can't press him. You got to be able to cover him. He started to show a little bit of that towards the end of last season. And if Tyreek Stevenson can come in and flourish playing opposite Jalen Johnson and with uh, with Kyler Gordon, I think the secondary could be very impressive this year. Plus, uh, Quanti Brisker also go out there doing some things. Uh, that's uh, I couldn't agree more. I think that the secondary is in for you know to take a leap. I mean, led by Eddie Jackson, they were the they were the bright spots of the defense last year. And when yeah. your your rookie safety is your leading sack guy, I hope that doesn't happen again. And hmm. just from your safety perspective, but the team is looking good and scary. I know that you're very optimistic about this team, Adam, and you know we are too. You know, Will. Before we close out, Will, do you have any more questions for Adam uh, before we close out with the final question? I was going to ask Adam, like, who do you see? Realistically or non-realistically, the Bears pursuing right now either via trade or free agency to come and play edge. Because to me, that edge spot, even if we get pressure, because like I said, like you said, Cousins, Jared Goff. If you go back and look at those games, they they, they love play action. The drop back. If, if if you could get pressure in their face and get them off the spot, then look at Jared Goff. We played the Rams. We beat them. I don't know if it was Sunday night or Monday night. Like it was the Sunday night game? Right. So, but we got pressure with Akeem Hicks and and Dovin. We had Mac and uh, Floyd coming from the edges. Like, who realistically do you? Or unrealistically at this point, because we made remember we made that acquisition of Mac right before right. Uh, the 2018 season kicked off. Like, because you you know the names that have been floating out there. I'm yeah, Daniel Hunter, uh, Bryce Huff. Because I got some friends that played the Jets. I'm talking to them. I'm, I'm trying to get the scoop before Schefter or Ian Rappaport. Yeah. But, like, who do you see that the Bears and, – and I know Yannick is, like, the overwhelming choice because yeah. he went from, I want to play for a Super Bowl contender to now, I just want a job. Yeah, give me a job. I, I, mean, I just want a job. So I want to eat. you see at this point that we can bring in, if nothing, like, to be a situational pass rusher at, 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 at least, at the least? You know, it's interesting, by the way, that Rams Bears game in 2018 was on my birthday. I remember it distinctly. I had to go to a boat party, like a Christmas parade party. This is the one thing that's terrible about having a December birthday is uh, is that uh, my birthday usually falls on people's like boat parade Christmas parties. And you're like, I don't I don't want to go to this for my birthday. <laughs> and I was forced to go to it. And I'm like trying to watch this game. I got a, my daughter would have been I would have had a newborn. Yeah, my son would have been newly born. My daughter was what, two, two and a half, three, no, two. So I had to go entertain these kids while trying to keep an eye on this game where we're smoking the smoking the Rams, which was wonder. It ended up being a wonderful evening. But the one thing about this is when they evaluated the team, although Ryan Pace always overinflated how great he thought our teams were, but I think it'll really come down to Ryan Poles taking a look at this team during camp during you know the first couple of preseason games and trying to get a sense of like how good can this team be and rightfully so i guess ryan poles did have the or yeah ryan ryan pace did have this correct to where he looked at the bears in 2018 and he said this team could be something special i need to go out and get khalil mack to push us over the top now if mitch trubisky had been able to develop and uh, I never thought that he would, and I wasn't a big believer in it. And I remember the night that he was drafted, I was like, this is a terrible pick. If there, was, if there was any quarterback that I wanted to take, and I mean, it looks terrible. Sean now. Watson. It's a, it, it sounds terrible now, like, but, right. but 
the guy who made the most sense was Deshaun Watson yeah. because he had done it at a high level. He was, and I'm in Texas, so I saw Patrick Mahomes at Texas Tech. He was number two for me. Yeah. So well, I would I would even have been like I wasn't as. Once he went to Kansas City, I'm like, okay, maybe there's something here, but uh, without, but still, Texas Tech quarterbacks, you're like, eh, I don't know, Deshaun Watson for me. But any, but in any event, they made a move because they felt that they were far enough along. If this team develops and we start seeing things and the people that are on the ground last year, you know, Ryan Poles was watching this team and he's like, yeah, we got to get rid of everybody. Bobby Quinn's gone. We're getting rid of, you know, we're just, we're just making trades. Like we're getting rid of Roquan, Ro everybody. <laughs> Roquan's gone. Bobby Quinn's gone. It doesn't matter. We already traded Khalil Mack. Like, yeah, I've, I've seen enough. It, the reverse could happen here. So if we end up going out there and making a move, like getting Chase Young or somebody like that, it means that the Bears front office and coaching staff is of the belief that this team is going to be competing for the NFC North. If we do nothing, then they might be looking at this being like, we've got too many holes. Let's hold on to our draft capital and let's take a charge at it in 2024, which both of those are acceptable to me. But Absolutely. at the same time, but I don't think that you would write off this season. Right. I, I really do believe that they, that Ryan Pace felt in 2018. And I think that he was justified in this, that the bears were a super bowl contending team. Cause you know, if they don't lose the, I think the the Dolphins game is the one that was probably the most frustrating to me or Mitch Trubisky getting hurt uh, and not being able to play against the Giants. Those two, you win either one of those games. The Bears are the two seed. They don't even play the Philadelphia Eagles. They play host to the Cowboys or the Rams. They play host to the Rams in the divisional round. They smoke them. And then the Saints always found a way to lose in the NFC Championship game. It's very plausible that the Bears would have gone, could have gone to the Super Bowl that season. Now, you need to remember the team that went to the Super Bowl that year was it was the Rams, right? That yes. was the Rams. They got embarrassed. Like Bill Belichick would have destroyed Matt Nagy by about forty. It would have been very embarrassing. It would have been the reverse of Super Bowl twenty, but we would have been there. So I, I gotta say, listen. If if we, they'll tell us, the Bears front office will tell us how far along this team is. Right. And if we go out there and we make a move, and if Chase Young is somehow playing for the Chicago Bears or these other big name guys, then hold on to your butts. This could be a great season. But honestly, do you think Chase is the most obvious choice? Because Commanders on the brand new leadership, they've yeah. already sunk man countless money into Jonathan Allen. Um, yeah. the, the three tech that I want to run the pain and now you got sweat coming up. So to yeah. me, they didn't exercise his um, fifth year option. Chase yeah, you gotta, Young is the obvious choice. Do you keep him long enough to see how much draft capital you can get? Because let's be honest, the commander, they don't need a quarterback. How is not the answer. Yeah. You know, the, the, the new ownership, they going to want their guy. Uh, Adam. So I, I see them selling off pieces as well, right before the trade deadline. And I do think Chase, like you said, it, the front office is going to tell us, depending on, and I'm looking at Nick, I always talk about my white boy, but I'm constantly analyzing because the first five games, realistically, we can start off four and one. Yeah, I could see that as well. Uh, the one thing, too, uh, with the Washington Commanders is they you have to you have to divest yourself from the defense. You can't put that much money into the defensive line, even though right. it's very important to build through the trenches, but your trenches are fine. Right. You've got great weapons on offense, but next year, even when you consider you'll probably be paying a rookie quarterback, mm -hmm. whether it's Caleb Williams or whomever it is, you still just can't have that many resources poured into one spot and you got to spread it around. So one of those guys has to go and right. you're, you're not going to want, you're not going to be able to franchise tag them because you can't have that high of a, you can't make him one of the top five, highest paid guys. So if there is a team and you know, if having multiple picks allows you the flexibility to move up and down in the draft, you got to be able to go ahead and take advantage of that. So I think that there is a very real chance that uh, Chase Young could be moved at some point. I'm excited about it. You know, if it's for the right price, I mean, you know, I mean, I think polls definitely won the Carolina trade. No doubt about it. It seems like he's got and it also, we talked about earlier, but the Jalen Carter, the one spot getting a fourth round pick, that worked out super well for the Bears. Huge. So I, 
he had worked out huge for the bears. And I think that, you know, why not? Why not? I don't, I'm not giving up a first round pick for him. I know we have two, no. but you know, for a couple no. of later picks, he's barely played the last two seasons. That's the one thing that still scares me. I've talked about this multiple times. I would not mind chase young, but it's gotta be for the right price. I'm not overpaying for him. And also it is the last year of his contract. He has a big season. He's going to want to get paid. So totally. You know, Which is, he's, he's probably going to do. Yeah. He's not yeah. going to miss any games. He's going to be out there for all 17. He's going to have the, the season of his career, which is going to cost you. Uh, yeah. But ultimately, they're going to let him walk. For, like, they, they can't franchise tag him. So if you want to get something for nothing, and if, if Washington's not very competitive, or if they feel like they're not going to be competitive and they look at their quarterback situation, they're like, ah, we're screwed. Yeah, then we might be able to get him for a little bit of a uh, discounted price. Absolutely. Absolutely. What a conversation today, by the by the way, guys. I, I couldn't appreciate it more. Ed, Will, one more, what, what do you got? No, I was going to tell Adam because two years ago, I know me and Nick, we went to the Rams and um, Bears game at SoFi. So this year for the Chargers, uh, we want some VIP treatment because let me tell you something. It took, well, I don't know about Nick, but it took me an hour to get away from SoFi to get back to Intercontinental to the, because the Ubers and, and, and li- like, have they fixed the logistical nightmare? Not at all. Not even a little bit. <laughs> oh my God. That's right. That's why I'm glad I'm going to see uh Wednesday night. I'm going to see Arsenal against uh, Barcelona. And thankfully I'll be able to park in our work parking lot. And you know what? Oh shoot. I should have to get there early, but in any event, uh, I'm glad I'm thinking of this, but in any event, like at least leaving the facility, like we've got kind of a straight shot of getting out of there. So it's pretty nice, but uh, yeah, it's a nightmare. It's not easy. It's not an easy stadium to get in and into and out of. But it's a great That's stadium. why I can't wait. I can't wait to get out of uh, Soldier Field, to be honest. Arlington Heights is almost fully demolished. I can't wait to be able to take a train or, you know, there's two train lines, three different highways. There's so much you can do. I also only live 15 minutes from it, so can't Perfect. complain too much about it. But Where yeah, are you, Schomburg? Hoffman uh, Estate? Uh, Displains. So a little bit, a little bit closer to the city, but close, you know, not too bad. Mm-hmm. I'm right next to Arlington Heights. I'm always out there for dinner. It's a good time. So I just, when I drive by every now and then looking at the stadiums or old Arlington racetracks slowly coming apart, it's happening. And that's just what makes me more excited because I don't have to walk eight blocks and still pay a hundred dollars for parking. Just oh to my go to God. Field. I know. It's yeah. so crazy. So, and you know, second small stadium in the NFL for what the fourth biggest market team, something's got to change, but you know, I'm excited for that for sure. But you know, Adam, can't thank you enough for coming on the show today. You know, it, we're super excited for this season. It's nice to hear that someone like yourself is just as optimistic as we are because you don't oh, hear yeah. it a lot. But your nope. start, waves are starting to happen a little bit more, I feel like, especially now that Fields was ranked the 86th player, according to players, in the NFL Top 100. Yep. So, And Jacksonville Jaguars fans are losing their minds and constantly in my DMs, and they're like, this doesn't make sense. And I'm like, I didn't Talk vote for the guy. Talk to the players. Talk That's to the not players. Player. The players voted Talk for the players. Not my fault. I didn't do yeah, it. Yeah, the players <laughs> voted for him. It wasn't yeah. me. Yeah, we didn't so, do it. And I guarantee you, after next season, if we're if he's going to do what we're all saying right now, he's going to be top fifty or even yeah. top twenty five. So hundred percent. Can't wait. Even can't Justin wait Jefferson him. said he's he's a superstar. Darius really? Slade, like they they're the ones saying it's not not just us. Yeah, I'm with him. <laughs> not hey. I like that other people are starting to, at least the players are on our page and you know, the rest of the fan base are eventually going to have to get on it. I think they're just in a little bit of denial about it, but you know, will Adam, thank you so much for joining this episode of just another year, Chicago. It was really a lot of fun. We can't wait to have you on again soon. I know we talked about potentially coming over to you. So whenever our door is yeah, always yeah, open. Yeah. yeah. We'll be, we'll, we'll be, be in touch. Yeah. 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 Well, we'll be in touch with you. Don't call <laughs> us. I will tell you. <laughs> I'll no, have my no, people. Read. No, no, no. no. Yeah. Hey, no, Your kidding. people. Will no, talk we'll do it again. People. No, we'll do the <laughs> home and home. Don't worry about it. I'll even split you guys up so you can finally have some like, cause I have the two kids. Uh, you want them to have their own solo experience. So we'll split you up so you don't have to feel. So Will doesn't have to carry you, Nick. So back and <laughs> forth and, and vice versa. So uh, we'll have you on sometime of the sick podcast with Adam Rake in the near future. Absolutely. Uh, with that. Now. Yep. And we'll, we got another show coming up here in a little bit. So we yeah. will definitely let you know about that one too, Adam. But, you know, thanks again, guys, for both jumping on to this episode of Just Another Year Chicago. My name is Nick Brody. Make sure that you go follow Will and Adam on both their separate socials, all in the description. But we will see you guys next time.